Good evening, everyone. Okay, so um, thanks to, uh, thanks for making it at this busy time of the semester. So um, my name is Bharat Shankar, and I am a year three DSA major, and I'm also the current head of workshops at the NUS Statistics and Data Science Society. Today, I'm here with uh, collaborating with NUS hackers to present a quick workshop as part of our data science project series. So this uh, workshop is going to be a brief intro to using Git and Docker for uh, deploying a data science project. So um, with that uh, with that done, let's basically get started. So uh, first, right, a brief history of Git. So Git is nothing but a distributed version control system. So that basically means that it allows you to basically keep different versions of a piece of code and basically manage those different versions. Basically, when you're dealing with a lot of developers in a lot of places, you basically need one way to keep everything consistent. So um, it was actually made by Linus Torvalds in 2005. And the story behind it is actually kind of interesting. And after the workshop, if you guys have the time, I do recommend that you look up the story of how uh, Linux basically shifted to using Git as a VCS. So um, if you basically think about a workflow without Git, right? Let's basically say that you have two developers. You have developer A and developer B. And developer A and B are working on the same project, right? So they have a certain set of files that they're both working on. But developer, but the thing is that there is no way for developer A and B to conveniently talk to each other and share information between their files without sending their files to each other one-on-one, -on -one, right? What they could do is that they could basically try to upload it to a centralized server. But then that brings us to an issue, right? What happens when developer A wants to change, wants to add on to what developer B has done? Developer A needs to go to the server, re-download the files that developer B has completed, and then work, make his changes on those, re-upload them back. So the whole thing becomes extremely cumbersome, and it actually causes a lot of issues when you're trying to collaborate with each other, when you're trying to add on some code into someone else's code base. So um, that's basically why we basically have Git. So what Git does is that it actually stores the changes in the files, right? So what happens is that like the with Git, there's actually no need to re-download files which you haven't really changed, right? Instead of checking, uh, instead of checking all of the files that uh, developer B has changed, Git manages that for you, and it downloads and it basically updates your files with the changes that developer B has made. Additionally, if you break something while you're trying to fix it, well, then there's no issue. There's almost always a way in 99.9% .9 of cases to undo a mistake that you made using Git. Okay. So um, as for how Git works, Git works uh, to understand how Git works, you basically have to think of your files as living in four separate locations. Okay. First off is your working directory, which is your computer. So basically, um, whatever files that you're coding on, right, whatever files you're working on, on that machine, uh, whenever you first create them, and then when you're updating them, those files live on your working directory. Now, uh, there is something called a staging area. So a staging area basically is a place where files go when you tell Git, hey Git, I want you to track the changes that I'm making to these files, okay? So, um, then what happens is that like uh, once you've made enough changes, you'll basically want to uh, you'll basically want to create like a checkpoint or like a safe state basically. So that is where you basically get to committed files. So a commit, a git commit, is basically like a checkpoint. It's basically like a marker of progress. So whenever you basically want to go back to a previous state, you usually go back to a previous git commit. Okay. And then finally, you have a remote directory. So a remote directory could be like some centrally managed server. It could be something like GitHub. It could be something like GitLab. So it's just some other remote directory where a copy of your code will also live. Okay. So um, in that case, let's talk about another interesting feature of Git, which is branching. So uh, sometimes, uh, in many cases, actually, we basically want to work on a feature without necessarily wanting to break all of the other parts of the code base, right? So in that case, what you can do is that you can create your own little copy of the code base known as a branch. 
So then what you do is that you just create a branch from a code base. Then what you do is that you make your changes, you commit your changes, and then once you're done, you can merge your branch back into your into the main code base. So that basically allows you to work on features in isolation. So that basically allows you to change stuff without necessarily breaking it for everyone else. Okay. Sometimes you basically may not want to merge it back. Sometimes you may want to spin it off into its own project, in which case it would be a fork, right? Then let's say that you broke something, that you messed up really badly on a git commit, right? So in that case, uh, let's ask ourselves two questions, right? You've saved your files on your machine, but you haven't committed it to git. Then there's no problem. Git allows you the ability to basically uh, reset all the changes that you have made, which haven't been committed. If you have changed it, you're not done yet. What you can do is that you can basically bring up all of the previous changes using git log, and you can always go one of the any one of the previous commits. So, um, in a, so the thing is that like I've kept this uh, talk rather brief for a reason. Uh, let's open up our terminals and let's get started with using git. Okay. So let me open up a terminal. Okay. So, um, I think you share your entire screen to Zoom because on Zoom you can only see this. Yeah. Okay. Let me just share my terminal. Okay. Yeah. So, um, can everyone like see the terminal? Yep. Okay. So, um, let's get started so let's basically go to uh let's create any let's just uh, create a directory okay so make directory i don't know uh git workshop okay so now we can cd into git workshop okay so now once you're in your directory uh, try to type the command git space init. Yeah. So you can actually see that now we've actually created. Uh, so if you get this sort of uh, response, you should be, that basically means that you now have a git repository started up in that, in that folder. So if you want to check how it is going, you can actually type git status. So you can see that we're on the master branch. It'll be master or main branch, depending on, uh, yeah, it could be master, it could be main. So you basically are on your main branch and you see that you haven't made any commits yet. So you have a blank git repository right here. Okay. Um, everyone's following along so far. Yeah. Okay, so now what we can do is that we can spin up a text editor and let's basically make a file, right? So vim hello.txt, right? So we can do uh, hello world, right? Okay, so we can see that we have added a small text file into our directory right here. However, if we look at our git status, right? We see that we actually haven't tracked the changes to the file. That is because this file currently is in our working directory. We haven't added it to our staging area just yet, right? Git is not tracking the features. Git is not tracking the changes that we've made to this file so far. So now what do we do when we need to transfer our files from our working directory into a git the into uh, our staging area we use git add okay so we can use git add hello dot txt right and you can check the git status now so we can see that we've actually moved our file from being untracked to now git tracking its changes right we haven't committed our file yet so this is also telling us what will be changed when we run git commit okay so we can run git commit, right? And then we can run with, the, we can run it with the flag M. 
So what git commit m does is that it just basically lets you add a message. Otherwise, it'll just open up a text editor and it'll ask you to fill up a message over there. So each commit will usually have a message with it. And for this message, we basically were, it's advised that you make something that's kind of informative that lets you see what happened in that commit. So, right. So we can say add it first file. Yeah. Okay. So um, we basically made our first commit and you can actually see that we've actually made one file and we've added one insertion into that file, right? Now what we can do is that we can actually go back into the uh, file itself, right? And let's say that like, I don't want to include hello world anymore, right? So now if I look at my git status, we see that we've actually like, it, it's tracked the change that we've made to hello.txt. So we can always like say, uh, made changes. Ah, yeah. So the thing is that like we haven't added the change that we've made. So we need to, so what we can do is that if we don't want to keep using git add and then git commit, we can always include the a flag in git commit. So that basically directly moves our file from the working directory into the, uh, into the committed files folder without needing to bring it to the staging area first. Okay. Now, let's basically say that we have uh, some information that we don't want people to, we don't want to share to others, right? But then we need this information for our project to run. So let's say that keys.txt, let's say, right? ABC123, let's say, is some sort of password that we're using in our program for authentication purposes. So in that case, right, we actually don't want Git to track the changes that we're making to keys.txt, obviously, right? Because it'll get uploaded somewhere and then like that's how you basically get data leaks. So in that case, right, what you do is that you can add a file called a dot git ignore file, right? So it tells Git that whatever file names or file name patterns that match this file don't do not track the changes that you've made to this file, right? So if you look at git status, right? Um, what do you think should pop up if we never added it to our git A? What do you think should pop up? You see that dot git ignore only pops up, right? The thing is that like, since we have added keys.txt to our dot git ignore, even though keys.txt exists in our exists in our repository. It's not being tracked by Git. So we can, so usually you'll want to keep your, your, your uh, authentication tokens and stuff like that in a separate file that is not being tracked by Git. And it's also useful for not putting stuff like PyCache files or IPYNB checkpoints or virtual environment files or even data files because Git is not meant for storing data sets. So um, we basically, uh, so now what we can do is that we can now add a commit, right? Added git ignore. Okay, so now let's say that we actually didn't like the change that we made. Let's say that we didn't, we want to undo our git ignore file, okay? What we can do is we can look at the git log, okay? So what the git log does is that it actually lets you look at all of the commits that have been made so far. 
Okay. So you basically have a commit and then you have this long string of characters right here. This is basically the SHA-256 hash of your commit. Okay. So usually you don't need to specify the whole thing. I think the first seven or eight characters should be more than enough to specify the hash unless you literally have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of commits. So let's say that we actually want to get back to before we added a git ignore, right? So what we first do is that we can run a git reset, right? Hard to wipe all of our any changes that we've made since our last commit. Then what we can do is that we can do git revert Now we see that if we do vim dot git ignore, yep. Yeah. So we can actually see that we've actually reverted the uh, made changes file, right? So if you look at make, uh, if you look at uh, hello dot txt, right? So if you look at vim hello dot txt, it's back to hello world rather than I am using git that we made the change to, right? So we've been able to effectively undo that change that we have made to our Git repository, even from a previous commit. Okay, now um, let's basically say that like, I want to work on a new feature, right? So I basically can go for Git checkout and I can put the B flag here showing that I want to make a new branch and I can say new feature. Right. Then I can put whatever I want for my new feature here. So I can say feature dot txt, right? I can say right. So now if you look at ls, right, we see that we've added a new feature over here. We've added that feature dot txt here. We can now do a git com. We can now add it to git, right? And we can commit. All right. Now we see that we've added it. We've added this new feature to our, we've added this new file to our directory, right? Let's say that we want to go back to main, right? So we can do git checkout master, right? Our master branch hasn't changed. Then what we can do is that we can do git merge. Um, if I remember correctly, it would be, what was the name again? New feature, right? Yeah. Okay. So now what we've done is that you can type, if we want to bring our new feature in, right? We can type git merge along with the name of the branch that we want to merge. So now we see that in our main, we are still on our main branch, but now we have the new feature from the new feature branch, right? So we've been able to get the changes that we made in another branch into our main branch again. Okay. Now, um, as for GitHub, right? So let's head on to GitHub because we've covered all of the main things that we've asked for over the, um, uh, we've covered most of what we've done of most of what we can do locally. Now it's actually time for us to try doing something on GitHub. So for GitHub, right? Um, we basically want to first, we basically want to create a new repository, right? So we can say messing around with Git, right? And then you can also add like a small description. You can add a readme file that basically shows off what's going on in your repository. And you could basically just start creating your repository. Okay. 
So now what you can do is that you can actually uh, copy this right here. So if you want to add a new remote, right? You basically can run git remote add origin and then you put in this and then you put in this link right here. If you don't know where to find this link other than here, right? Um, I'll show it to you. Uh, you can either do it in, uh, it'll be selected here by default. So you'll basically get this if you set up and you can run this if you've set up a SSH key with GitHub. So if you run this, you basically now add a remote repository for your current repository right here. That basically means that if I now run git push, right? Git push, yeah, we need to run this for the first time. Okay. So now uh, if we run git push setup stream origin master, and then we run, and then we reload this, we actually see, hey, whatever we've done over there, whatever we've done in uh, GitHub, whatever we've done locally is now visible on GitHub right here, okay? So um, usually if you want to like uh, look at, um, if you want to get the link again so that you can add like an existing repository as a remote, you can always click on code over here and then you'll basically get an SSH right here, right? So if you copy this link right here, and let's say that I go back to my documents and I want to create, and I want to clone that repository from the remote, right? If I want to pull a repository from somewhere, I can do git clone and supply this, and supply this link. So now it actually pulls in the entire repository and if I go into messing around with Git, it's all here. Okay. So um, now, uh, can I have someone's uh, GitHub uh, repository handle if anyone doesn't mind? Uh, may I have someone's Git repo? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I want to add you on as a collaborator. Yeah, so uh, if you don't mind coming up here and then like just keying in your uh, GitHub handle, that'll be great. So you'll, so you'll basically be asked to enter your password to confirm it. Okay, so you can just uh, key in your just key in your GitHub handle. I don't know if I can even enter it. GitHub handle, that's it. Oh, just the handle, just the just the, just the username. Verify, verify your like password or something. No, 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 you don't need to. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, okay, sure. Okay, now uh, you should have received an invite. So just accept that invite. So um, anyway, right? Um, does anyone have any issues with what's been taught so far? Like everyone's been able to keep up more or less. This has just been like a brief overview of the of basics of Git. Now, normally, like you don't need to. Uh, I don't think most people. Git has a lot of commands, so you don't really need to memorize all of them. Like I think. Uh, the ones that we've done here plus a couple more are basically all that you need for most cases. Yeah. I do have a couple of questions for. Yeah. So, what do you mean by 
Yeah. Uh, for hey, when you want to do what? I can just say all because I have a mistake. So I'm still far away. Yeah, maybe I just clean that off. Hey, uh, if I get that, maybe then you will go. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I'll have to take the documentation on that. Um, because there are very, very subtle differences between like the different functionalities. Right. I think this reset part basically brings you back to your previous commit, no matter what. Yeah, I think it just cleans everything off any changes you make with the previous commit. Like there are a lot of uh, fun differences. Like when you're using git pull versus git fetch, there's actually a difference between the two. Git pull changes files that you've already that are already there, whereas git fetch just brings in new files. Yeah. 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 Like, as I said, right, there are hundreds of commands of git, right? So there's always a, there are, there's some functionality usually for what you want to do. Yeah, but then like these few commands that we've covered so far are usually what you will need for most use cases. Right, um, have you accepted the, yeah, yeah okay. Um, okay, so just clone uh, that git repository. Yeah, with SSH. So you click code over here, right? Ah, then it'll just ask you for your username and password then. You just key in that into your terminal. Um, if, uh, if, if, uh, actually, right, you can actually write it up with the person sitting next to you. You can basically, like, ask them for their data and then you can uh, add them to a data repository that you have, you can ask them to, like, apply to it. So, I encourage you to actually try this out. Okay, sure. Okay, yeah. So now you've thrown into it, right? Can you uh, do. Okay. Uh, can you add a file? Can you submit the change? Anything. So make a commit. So add it to add it first. Yeah. Add it. Then we come in. Okay. 
Yep, so you're ready to push your file, right? Um, you can, uh, wait, uh, you edit your password, right? Have you accepted the invite? Have you gotten the email and really accepted? Um, have you have you accepted the invite? Yes, I think you should be Ah, it's the second Okay. Um, here, right? Uh, for this, right? I have added it to the repository. So, yeah, just add your repository and then you can add it as a So, it's push your chain, right? Yeah. Okay, um, let's reload, right? So um, he managed to set up his changes and then like he's been able to uh, push them. Let's see if they've been added. Yeah, see, um, you can actually see that like on my GitHub, right? On GitHub, he's actually been able to add his change right here in this new file.txt, right? So in that case, we can always, then I can always go back, right? And then I can always type a uh, git pull. And if I look back on my local machine, I see that I've been able to download the file that he has changed as well. All right, so um, right now we'll go for a little bit of a break. So in the break, right, just 
from just basically like with the person right next to you, right? Try to see if you can set up a Git repository, see if you guys can basically like pull from or push uh, uh, to each other's repositories. Uh, can I have a look at the uh, what? Can I have a look at the GitHub repository? Oh. No, 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 the GitHub repository. Uh, the, uh, the, create a GitHub repository first. Um, okay. No, doesn't need to be. Yeah. Uh, hi everyone. So we prepared some uh, live discussion for you guys. It's like a clear two part. So just feel free to take uh, however much you want. Yeah, we will maybe take a break for 10 minutes and then we will start with the Docker sessions. <laughs> Uh, is there any uh, that you John X one? I'm going to talk about that, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um. One second. Uh. Have we set up an expert at Okay, uh, can you like on for the remote origin already exists, right? So John, we need some remote repositories. Um, Yeah. 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 No. You create a new branch on it. Yeah. Head. Head is a special pointer in game. Head refers to your most recent commit. Depends. I think uh, it's more likely recent person to get from more are more likely to use main rather than Yeah, I got that. 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 Yeah, I got that.
and there's a lot of small bit flow. Like if you miss something, then to that. If you want to use the PAT method, it's in the US. So you have, and it expires in one year. So like you can say for permanent, but they suggest you don't do that for security. So maximum you can set it for one year. And after that, you can do it. After, yeah. after one year, you can't remember how you mentioned it. It's exactly this uh, pointer. It's exactly the like nature of that. Like, it's annoying enough that you get money to do it again. But it's short enough that you don't remember how everything was done. But at least as I say, like everybody knows. Yeah. So you can always ask somebody else. Right. But the thing is, you should be a CEO. I remember. I remember. What and only I have to do is that I thought it was a little bit too clear that they should be confused. Do you think I can do that? Um, okay, so I'm not 100% uh, what do you say, well versed on like these specific types of keys. Um, I think that like uh, these, the, the, if I look at the types of keys, right, that were, that were not to be used, right, if I could have a look at that, right, um, GitHub SSH. Yep, so yeah, so basically, like DSS keys are not allowed, but then uh, usually uh, you have RSA keys are okay. She's ready after. I'm great and going to use. There are some limitations. That's why I recommend these kind of keys. Yeah. So just go ahead and then just use whatever they recommend to so as they avoid headache. I'm just seeing somewhere that they that they could use a GPG key. Although I haven't, I've never used it before. <laughs> I I think they've stopped using those. Let me just see. Oh, we can generate a new GPG key. more of a model. Oh, so it's actually easier than that. Oh, easier than that. Then why don't you use it? In fact, you can even uh, you can copy coding. Right. 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 I think GPG keys are mainly used for just signing commits. So, like, in every single commit, we are doing <laughs> I think it's used for like more like enterprise scale things where you would want to sign commits and show that like this is like more this is like a verified commit by this by this author. If you have to, if you have to. Input a GPG key for every single commit. That's a bit even worse than CPS. I'm 
Uh, Richard, I'll set up. I'll just like, connect your computer because you'll be doing it next, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Do you be seeing him? Uh, I'll probably be heading to the audience. Like, I'll just be walking yeah. around. Sure, sure. And then like, you, you can help them out with. Yeah. Sure. Maybe you can help him try to see what's wrong with this SSV happening. It's a, it's a headache, huh? Yeah. I'll probably leave to get um, leave the Zoom meeting as well. Sure. Okay, so uh, if everyone ready, let's get started with the doctor component of this workshop. Okay, so um, this workshop is really about. Uh, an introduction to Docker, right? Um, but the reason you want to use Docker actually is to really improve your development experience. Um, and today we'll be going through a lot of uh, basics of Docker and also delving slightly into uh, what we think will help you the most in terms of uh, when you're developing your own applications. Yeah, so. Okay, so why use Docker? Uh, it's, it's a term that is uh, you might have heard like flying around when when you uh, maybe when you're interning when you're like, checking out other people's git repository you will see this docker file and a lot of people like to talk about docker but what does it actually do is that it makes developing your own applications much easier by streamlining your development workflow so uh there's three main reasons why you want to use docker the first is the ease of use so once you set up docker and yes there is a instant learning curve with Docker, but once you set it up, you can deploy that project initiated with Docker anywhere. So uh, like the, the, the popular cloud platforms like AWS, GCP, they all support containerization um, like tools like Docker. So you can just upload it there and it will run without you needing to configure much. Um, a, a second thing about ease of use is that when you actually, when someone else actually pulls, like git pulls your repository with a Docker file inside, they can actually just run Docker and um, they will basically see whatever you, you can see uh, because Docker is basically wrapping your application up in this like, uh, in, in a way that doesn't really interact with your host machine. So it doesn't matter if I develop my application on a, on a MacBook and then you are pulling it from a Windows machine and there will be some dependency problems probably, but Docker ensures that uh, these dependency problems are uh, mitigated. Uh, the second thing is speed, right? So like an alternative to Docker is actually something like uh, spinning up your own virtual machine and then loading up your application in that. That is technically like you're yeah, isolating the application. But um, you can imagine Docker is much more specialized to actually run a single application. And so it's much faster. Now illustrate that in a diagram uh, after this. And the third is Docker Hub. So what Docker Hub is, is it's like GitHub, but for Docker images. So it's like an online repository where people store their Docker images that they have made. And there's a lot of official ones provided by Docker. So if you're worried that, okay, like if I don't do the configuration at deployment, uh, I need to do it locally now. And that's a lot of hassle. Well, uh, the third point basically says that uh, you will find a lot of these pre-made or uh, almost complete Docker images that you can just use for your projects. So this is a diagram to show uh, basically point number two, right? About if you want to use a virtual machine versus you want to use 
uh, Docker for containerizing, uh, containerizing your applications. So if you use a VM, let's say we are on a server and the server has its own host OS, which is typically Linux. Uh, if you want to have a VM on top, you will need to basically spin up uh, a virtual machine uh, on top of the hypervisor. And then you load your applications and all the dependencies on top of it. So like this is what, this is the whole stack that you need to basically get up and running before your application will, will start working. But do, what Docker tries to do, as you can see, is it basically merges your guest OS and your hypervisor uh, together. So it will sit on top of your host OS. You can run it on Mac OS, you can run it on Windows, you can run it on Linux. And uh, Docker is a specialized solution that will help you manage like uh, how to containerize each application that you have. Sorry? Some limitation. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we will get into it through the workshop. Um, okay, so the outline for today, after now that you know what Docker is really about, is setting up Docker. Uh, we sent you guys an email yesterday night, but uh, we'll just spend five minutes helping those who haven't set it up yet to set it up properly. Uh, also, I'll go through basic terms and term, basic terms and commands that you might use in Docker. And then you would be met with this thing called the Docker image. And we will go through with you how to actually make your own Docker image. So as I mentioned, there are uh, configurations that are already made official by Docker, and those are official Docker images. And now we can also make our own custom Docker images. And then we'll proceed to multi-container environments. It's a big word, but it's really not that scary. Uh, it's a very natural extension to what we will learn uh, when making Docker images. And then uh, number five is basically saying, uh, okay, so we have a multi-container environment. How do we manage this environment? And it's using this tool that is called Docker Compose. So you can actually access these slides um, using this link. Okay, so first of all, setting up. Um, we, we sent you an email with all the guides, but uh, has anyone not set it up yet or are having some issues with it? Uh, we can dedicate some time to this. All right. So, like, as you guys are like launching your Docker desktop, um, when like a few years ago, when you tried doing Docker, it doesn't come with its own GUI. So now we download it. We download it as like a package. You have a GUI, and then you also have the command line interface. Um, so. Uh, we will be dabbling with both the GUI and command line today. Uh, mostly command line, but uh, I'll show you a bit about how to use the GUI to dabble with it. Right? It, it, it. Your workflow can involve both of them at the same time. Um, if you set up Docker correctly and it's uh, started running on your machine, you can just do Docker run hello world. And okay, this command, what, what, what it does, right? Uh, maybe just a pre uh, slight introduction before we even get into all these Docker images stuff. Uh, doc Hello World is an uh, official Docker image that is supported by Docker itself. And it's really just a way to test whether you're not working. We provided this image for us so you can uh, test whether it's working or not. Um, and after you run Hello World, you should see something like, uh, let me just show you. Okay. So Docker run, hello world, it should, you should see this. And this means you are doing it correctly. Um, because I already have the image pre downloaded. Uh, I think for some of you, we run Docker run, hello world, it will have to download the image. 
So as I, as I mentioned, right, Docker Hub is this online repository of all the images. When you, when you do a uh, Docker run Hello World, it will basically download that uh, image from the online repository into your machine and then run it. And after, you, after it runs, it will say hello from Docker. So, okay, if anyone doesn't get this message, let me know. I don't actually know about the direct So yeah, uh, one of our participants brought up an interesting question. Uh, so so there are other containerization technologies as well. I, I showed you like a virtual machine versus Docker, right? But honestly, they're not really comparable. They're not really meant for the same thing. When you spin up a virtual machine, you are trying to run a whole OS, you can do anything, you can play a game in a virtual machine. But for Docker, you're just trying to run everything. So uh, uh, one participant there asked, like, what about alternatives like Hotman? Um, I haven't delved too much into it myself, but uh, I think one like advantage of Docker is definitely the whole ecosystem. Point number three, remember about uh, there being a lot of pre-built images officially supported by Docker uh, that you can just use without much hassle. And the fact that you have such a large community on there means that for most things, you will have an image available. Exactly. You can upload your image. Uh, after you create a custom image later, you can even upload it online and other people can download it. Yeah. Like I think that they have a full blown TensorFlow, PyTorch, machine learning, basically any machine learning uh, flow that you would probably want, you have a Docker image for it. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, let's go on to Docker terminologies. Uh, there's a really a lot of like words, new words that you might experience when coming into the world of Docker. And it's quite intimidating, I will admit. So images. Images are the blueprint of making your Docker containers. So your Docker containers are actually the, 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 the ones that are running your application. Your application is contained within a Docker container. But how do you make this of Docker container? You use a Docker image. So it's kind of like, um, it's not you learn like uh, programming, right? There's like classes, and then you instantiate objects from classes. The classes are like Docker images, and then your object that you instantiate is your Docker container. Uh, one thing to know about container is that they are stateless, which means that you can't actually store any, like, when you run an application once in a container, and then you run that same container again after you stop it, uh, there's no, like, so-called state that is carried over. And uh, you might be thinking, okay, like, if I have a database, then obviously I want my application to store state, right? Uh, then something called a volume comes into play, a Docker volume. But uh, we won't cover that too much in this workshop. But just so you know, uh, Docker daemon and uh, Docker client. So these two are not that important. I mean, these three are not that important. Uh, just for you to know when you read like the Docker documentation, what they are about. Um, Docker client basically uses the Docker daemon to, uh, like Docker daemon is the brain of the operation and Docker client use it to interact, uh, to, to type commands into uh, asking Docker what to do. And then Docker hub again is like GitHub, uh, online repository of, a lot of images, uh, some uploaded by users, some officially supported by Docker. Um, you, you can download them and use them as you wish. Okay, some basic commands. Uh, Docker images, as you can imagine, lists out all the images that you currently have on your uh, local machine. And then Docker pool is you, like git pool, right? You can see some similarities here. Uh, you're pulling the image from your Docker hub, from your online repository into your local machine. Docker run, 
and then you put the image name here, like just now Docker run Hello World, right? Hello World is the image, and then now you're running this image, it will create a container. So Docker run is really the command that like support puts everything together. Now you have a running container with an application inside. Uh, Docker PS is basically seeing all the containers that you have. So let's go through this four, uh, top four first. Uh, so yeah, okay. Doc and, and you can run this anywhere in your in your directory. I, I'm just in a current like uh, project directory, but you can really run this anywhere. So Docker images, you can see all the images I have. Uh, so like these are the ones I've pre-used or like downloaded beforehand. And then Docker PS uh, is the, uh, the containers I'm running. So as you can see, right, I'm actually like not running any container. And that's because I'm, I didn't Docker run anything. So if I Docker run like hello world, uh, it will run and then it will immediately quit because like the, 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 it's not like a web application, right? It's just a like simple echo out something application. So if I Docker PS, it still won't show. But if I Docker PS uh, dash A, it will actually show that I ran this hello twice. Um, and the dash A basically means uh, show all containers, even if they have existed. So that's why when I docker ps, I don't see anything. When I docker ps dash A, I see these two that I just, just ran in front of you guys. Yeah, so uh, a lot like Git, um, there's a lot of flags you can use, uh, additional optional arguments you can pass in. Um, okay, just one thing to note, right? Uh, when you docker run, and then you pass in the image name. When you pass in an image name that you don't already have on your local machine, Docker is smart enough to just pull it for you. So you can, I mean, like in maybe in some cases you never have to use Docker pull. Uh, but Docker run, if if you don't already have the image, it will pull it and then run it at the same time. Okay, the next few commands, uh, Docker stop. So like if your container is like a web application that runs on forever, then you need uh, some way to tell it to stop, right? And the way to tell it to stop is Docker stop, and then you pass in the container name. How do you know what the container name is? Uh, well, you can either specify yourself in the run command. You can actually do a additional argument like dash dash name, and then you type out the name you want to put. Or you can literally Docker PS. Docker PS, and then you, you pass in a container ID. So these IDs uh, uniquely identify uh, Docker, uh, the Docker container. Um, Docker remove is to remove the container. So when you stop the container, it doesn't get automatically removed for various reasons. Uh, and then for Docker IMI is to remove the image. So the image, like the hello world image you just put, you want to remove that image, you think it takes up too much space on your computer, you can IMI it. And then Docker dashes help for the whole list of Docker uh, commands that we can't get into today. Okay, so Docker images, right? So let, let, let me explain what a Docker image is. I told you that it's a template to make a Docker container. Um, we can put it on Docker Hub. So there are official ones. And then the official ones are like, you will actually see an official label. Like if you go on Docker Hub, you, you, you can see some images that has an official label. So like if I come in here and then actually, You can browse all the images basically. Okay, well, I'm not logged in, so I'm not gonna log in now. Uh, you can browse the images and then you see your official label and that's how you know that it's uh, official supported by Docker. And then uh, we went through the Docker image part already. So, okay, then you're wondering, right? So we can pull images from Docker up using uh, Docker pool. But then what if we wanna make our own custom image? And why do you wanna make our own custom image? Actually, uh, most of the time, when you make an application, you need your own custom uh, image, uh, especially for web applications, um, which is a very common use case. Because like, you don't need to do too much. Uh, you just need to take like a base image from Docker Hub, and then you add on a bit of stuff yourself to make it tailored to your own application. For example, what port you want to run it on, uh, what command to execute it. So if, if your application file is called like predict.py, as we will we'll see later, then you wouldn't really expect like a Docker Hub uh, base image to already have predict of UI, right? What if you name it really something really weird like like 10 access? Then you you all these things you gotta specify in your own custom Docker file. And what a Docker file is, right, is to make a Docker image. So uh when you when you create a Docker file, you can Docker build. 
and I'll show you that later. You can, and then you'll create an image for you. Yeah, exactly. Docker file is essentially a script. So, uh, so today we'll be using this sample app provided by uh, Angular SDS. Uh, it's this really simple app to basically you you pass it you pass in the image. It's a web app, lah. The Flask web app. You pass in an image to Swap, and then it will tell you what the prediction is, like what it thinks that image is, like basically computer vision kind of thing. So, uh, we can we can we can get into it. So, um, I'm just gonna go into the virtual environment in in Python. Uh. Okay, so to show you what the app actually does, um, I've created this image. This image is called uh, this thing. Oh, wait. So I need to actually like do a dash P um, and then 80, 80, 5,000. So I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys know what all that does later on, but I'm just trying to get the application to run. And then okay, so we we basically uh Docker run started the application right. The application is now running inside the Docker container. Uh, and now I I use the predict test .py. That's why I ran this Python predict test .py. I'm running this test file to test my route to see whether it does what I I want it to. So I'm passing in this image. This is the image that I passed in. And, and what it does is it looks like an ankle ankle boot, right? So um we we, we want to see what the model that we have in, in inside here will say it is. So you see it says that the category is ankle boot and it thinks the probability is 100 percent So it's very confident about that. So that's what the app does. It's a really simple app. Um exposes a route, you put the image to the route, it shows back to you what you think it is. Um, okay, so uh, I can just control C to quit. Uh, I could also do like Docker Storm, as I mentioned earlier, but control C works too. Um, okay, so that's the, the quick walkthrough. So um, to, to make that happen, to do the Docker run in the first place, I had to make a Docker file, and this is that Docker file. So let me walk you guys through this Docker file uh, right now. Okay, so uh, do you guys have the application installed? Um, like the, the code is on your machines right now. So you sent it out over email. Um, so if you guys look at the code base, right? Uh, you will be you guys will be missing Docker file, uh, which is this thing. So uh, personally, I already made a Docker file, and that's why my Docker run could work. So like this thing over here, Docker file. Uh, you guys should have everything else other than Docker file. So uh okay, so what does this Docker file do? Um you can you, you guys can create a file in the directory, root directory of your application, and then call it Docker file with a capital D, uh no need any extensions, and then you type all these lines in. So from the first the first uh line over there, the first right directive is the base image to use. So this is a flat application which means you need Python one. Is built uh, using on the Python language, right? So uh, you do from Python 3.8, uh, and this Python 3.8 is uh, um, 3.8 is a working number, it's a tech number, and then Python is the official image that is supported by Docker um, that you're pulling from Docker Hub. So that's the base image. And then you're setting your working directory for the app. So, like, uh, remember the diagram we, we saw earlier, which is Docker is sitting on top of the host web. So you can imagine that Docker is actually, like, every container in Docker actually has its own file system. So it's not like you run Docker and then you can uh, go into your Finder on your Mac and just like easily see whatever files are there. So the file system is actually separate, uh, intentionally separate from your host OS. And that's why you need to set a working directory for your Docker container. Basically, um, in the container file system, separate from the host file system, uh, where to put this code, like where to put all this uh, where to put the code that you want to run. So your code is currently on your host, host file system, right? You want to move it to your um, Docker container file system. And here you are specifying where to move it to. And here you are saying, okay, the thought, the first thought is uh, your current directory, your current um, application uh, folder. 
And then the second dot is uh, basically that working directory. So the two dots are different. You're copying from your whole, uh, host file system to your Docker container file system that you, uh, that you specified there. Why can you two different locations? Yes, it, will, it is confusing, but um, so uh, this copy directive it knows that the first one will be from the host file system, and then it knows that the second one would be referencing the Docker working directory, which is specified here. So this dot will actually refer to this dash app, and this dot will refer to whenever you're executing the command. Yes, you should be able to. Um, okay, then after this, this run directive basically says, okay, now that you are in this working directory, you are in the slash app working directory, uh, what should you do like now? Um, so we have this requirements.txt file, which you guys should have in your code base also. And it, uh, it's a Python way of basically saying, here are all the dependencies that I need for this application. So you see there's a bunch of them. Um, and Flask, of course, being one of them because we're using a Flask application. So this will this this command will basically say uh install pip install all the dependencies that are found in requirements of txt and so th this will this will not install on your host machine this will install on the working direct the, the docker container uh, file system so to think about it very simply right you set a working directory here and all these commands will basically start executing on that docker file system from now on It, it will not affect your host machine at all. If you Docker install, uh, sorry, if you pick install here, you're not installing on your host machine. Uh, not, not your host machine file system. You're installing in the Docker container itself. Um, okay, this expose, right, is actually supposed to be 5,000. Because uh, why 5,000? Uh, we are exposing a, the container, the, the Docker container should expose. So so I keep I keep mentioning this is the container, this is the Docker container, and this is the whole fi host file system. So it's sitting on top of the host file system. And when you say expose 5,000, right, you're saying that this container should expose 5,000. This host, your whole system will have a different set of ports. And we'll see how these two are linked later on. But yeah, so we are saying this uh, um, expose the port fi number 5,000 on uh, this Docker uh this this docker engine okay and then the last thing is to run the command uh basically this is this is run the app basically uh and we run the app by python and then why predict.py it's because uh our uh, that's the name of our file inside here uh so this is the main file predict.py that's why we are uh, running this file and so again uh when when this when this runs, right, when command runs, it will run inside uh, the Docker container. It will be running inside there. Okay, any questions about this Docker file? You guys can try to type this in. It's quite a lot to take in, but uh, it's a very, okay, this is a very simple, like almost like the bare minimum of a custom Docker image. Like you can't, you can't be much more simple than this. This is literally doing one, one thing per, per line, right? Like you definitely need to expose the port number, you definitely need to run the application, and you definitely need to install the dependencies. So that's that's like the most skeletal you can get. Yeah. yeah, you can. Um so yeah, also question. So five thousand is actually the the so called the common port number for plus application. So uh each like if you run a Node.js application. It will be a different port number that it's for. Like if it's just arbitrary, I, I guess you can read out about why you choose 5000. But for class applications, you usually run on 5000. That's why we stick to 5000. Uh, you can run it on other ports, but I think like port like 88 is hit by the HTTPS, HTTP server on your computer. So uh, when you if you run it on some weird ports like that, it will say, oh, well, this port is really being used. You cannot you know, use that port. Hey, but uh, you realize that. This, we are exposing port 5000 here. But then when we actually, let's say we go to our browser and then we want to access this application. You, you would think that, okay, maybe intuition tells you, okay, I should just do localhost slash 5000. That should bring me to where this application is running. But it won't because it's, the 5000 is, is on the Docker. Your browser is sitting in the host 
um, in the host part. So how do you make the host go, uh, I guess, go to port 5000? So here's what I'll go through with you next. Um, okay, so after you build your, uh, after you have your Docker file, which is this thing, you can now run this command, docker build, dash t is the, the so-called like the name of the image. So uh, you, the, 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 the common way to name it is your username, your docker hub username, or actually whatever you use, username you want, and also your project name. So you can, uh, you can leave this out, yeah, sorry, you can leave uh, this dash t flag out, but if you leave it out, right, then uh, I think Docker will assign some weird arbitrary name, like a random name to your image. And you it, you find it very hard to refer back to your image. Lah. So if you want to use this image for um, other occasions, you should name it. And all this here is basically explaining what I was trying to illustrate just now. Okay, so yeah, after you build this, uh, you should, it should take a while actually, because uh, remember in our Docker file at the top, we are, we're seeing from Python uh, version 3.8. So it will actually pull this image uh, from Docker Hub. And pulling this image, some images can, I think most of the images are like a few hundred megabytes. So it will take some time for you to actually pull it onto your local machine. Um, yes. Execute this command with inside the directory that you've put your uh that you've put your image in. So I put my image in this uh this Docker like I need my my project Docker files lah. It's uh, not a very good name, but uh I put it inside there. So if I ls, I should be able to okay. Let me quit this application. Okay, something is going on. Okay, so doc, I mean, this Docker files directory, if I ls, then you can see that my Docker files here. And this is the directory I should be running the Docker build in. I mean, um, that is if you want to use the dot. If you, if you don't want to use the dot, you can technically uh, trace to where your Docker file is. Yeah. So has everyone got it working? It should, you should be downloading a bunch of stuff. It should be running and running, uh, trying to make your, create your image. So after you've built, right, uh, now your image has been made. Uh, you have your own custom image now. So that's pretty cool. Um, my image is called, okay, let me just show you all the images I have again. Uh, my image is this one over here. So this is the one that I made for um, using this fast app, which is why just now I ran Docker ran um, this. So uh, you can see your, you should be able to see your image now after you run Docker images. And then uh, after you build your image, now you can finally run it. So when you run the image, remember, it creates a container, a Docker container. And, and that's why this, this uh, command is basically what I did just now. 
except you, you will see a few new flags here. This is the name flag I was talking about. So if you run your image, you want your container to have a name, right? I mean, otherwise it will just show you a random name. Uh, but if you want a name, then you dash dash name, you call it whatever you want to call it. So in this case, I just uh, called it Flask app. Very generic name. Okay, so what does this dash p do? I was I was say I was mentioning how you would uh, access port five thousand, right? So this is how you access it basically. When you run the image, uh, you do a dash p, and then after that you put uh in this format, the port you want to expose on your host forward to the port that is being exposed on your Docker container, which is why five thousand follows eighty eighty. So uh, 5,000 is over here. We want to, we, we are basically telling Docker, you run this application and you expose 5,000, but you forward uh, all calls to 8080 to 5,000. And this is something that they call port forwarding. So this, this part is pretty important because otherwise you will not be able to access your application that is running. But if you run your 5,000, um, You'll be running on 5000 on your doc, uh, Docker part, but not your host part. And then at the end, you can just Docker stop the name of your app, the name of your container, and you'll stop it. Okay, so one thing to note is that Docker file, your Docker file that you just made, uh, this thing over here, <laughs> this, this file, right, is actually only, sorry, it's a bit small. This file is actually only run once when you build the image. So um, when you do Docker build and then you give it give your image a name, it will run through this file, but that's the only time you'll do it. Um, if you if you do Docker run, which is to create a container from that image, it will just use whatever is downloaded in this. So you can kind of see a problem, right? Because let's say if I change my predict.py, I add a new route to so it's a fast app so i i add a new route let's say uh this let's just call it high and then uh define high whatever it does right like return if you do this route and you command s you save it your running docker container even if you stop it and run it again it won't actually know about this change because if you think about it, the only time that we are moving this code into the Docker, moving this code from the host part into the Docker part is in the Docker file. So this part, copy. So only at this step are we copying the code into our Docker, into the Docker portion. And so if you run, if you Docker run the same image, uh, it will use the file that you copy like when you build, first build the image. Are you guys following? So um, if, if, if I run, like if, if after I edit this route and I run um, the, the same Docker image again without rebuilding it, it will actually not have this route because it doesn't know that I added this. So that's something to take note, but it's like, you would think that that's quite a hassle, right? You need to Docker build every single time you want to make any change to your container, uh, to your code base. So uh, we will show you how to mitigate that problem later on with a tool called Docker Compose. Um, you don't have to use Docker Compose to get around this, but it's the easiest and the most straightforward way. Most people use Docker Compose. So, okay. Um, do you guys want to just try running this string of commands? Uh, so, okay.
So later on, we will be going through this application um, to show you a multi-container app. And in this app, it actually uh, so-called like uses an image by itself. So this is a this is Docker Compose. It's not a Docker file, but um, what I'm trying to say is this one will actually use an image by itself. Uh, without like building your own custom image. So uh, usually when we run this kind of applications that you can just take a bit of image from uh, Docker, uh, it's usually to run it alongside um, something, uh, another application. So in this case, this is an elastic search service that we don't have to modify ourselves. So when we run it, um, we actually communicate with it through the Docker network. So, we, okay, Docker has its own file system, but it also has its own network. So your computer has its own network, Docker has its own network. It's, you can think of it as a, just a separate, isolated from the whole thing. Um, so it, it, your, application, your containers will actually communicate with each other through this Docker network. And uh, when it communicates through this Docker network, right, you can uh, actually just use the name of the container. So, which is ES in this case. Um, So, okay, it's, I, I don't think it's, uh, I, I think I'm doing not a so good job at this because uh, I, I need to show you like what this does. So maybe you reserve the question first. Um, what I'm saying is usually when you need to expose your own ports, then you, you would do a Docker file that exposes the correct port. If, uh, but if you just use an image without creating your own custom Docker file, um, you usually refer to it by name in another application, in another container. Okay. Okay, so this, this is a really simple one. Uh, if your application crashes, if, if your application has issues when you try to access its uh, route, what, how do you check that? So you just go to your Docker desktop, uh, literally go to container, and then you see, I didn't, I, didn't name my, I didn't name my Docker containers just now. I didn't put the dash dash name. So that's why it just created random names for me, which isn't very helpful. But if I click into it, you can just see the logs basically what you see like just now I, 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 I tried to test the slash predict route, right? So it, it, it now shows in the log that I tried to do that. Um, the CLI version is Docker logs and then the container name. So th this should be container name. Yeah, then you'll be able to see the logs. Uh, another useful thing, I guess, is to just now when I did Docker run, I did this, right? You can do a dash D. And what dash D does is actually a very useful command. Uh, it's a very useful flag, which is to say run this in detach mode, which means detach it from the terminal. So just now you realize that when I was running it, my terminal got like, basically my terminal had to be reserved for the logs of this app, right? Like the app, uh, how the app is running is shown on the terminal. But if I want to use the terminal for something else, and I don't really care what the logs is, then I just do slash D. And then you see, it, it will just run it, and then it will return me my terminal. I can start typing new stuff again. But it's running in the background. So uh, that's what detach mode does. Uh, if you go to your Docker GUI over here, go to container, uh, you will see that it actually is still running in the background. It's green color over here. Um, so you can just manual, I mean, you can stop it in the CLI or you can just stop it here. Okay, any questions? Okay, so, uh, okay, now the next part about multi-container environment, which is kind of what I was leading to just now, uh, when I talked about having multi multiple containers, and if you don't expose the ports specifically on one of them, you can actually access this, uh, this container using its name on the network. So I would explain to you what a Docker network is. Um, so like we've, we've successfully built an application uh, using Docker that runs in its own container. Uh, but actually if you think about it, in, in the real world, you will need many, you, you are likely to use many more services uh, together, together to run your application. 
So your application could be a cloud cap, it could have a Postgres SQL uh, database, it could use a uh, Memcache, it could use Redis, um, all these things, right? And especially in like big companies, uh, even startups, they, they, will, they will need this kind of thing to get the whole application working. It's a multi-part application. You're not just running a Blast app. So when you need multiple services like that, you could say, okay, I, I can just bundle all of them in the Docker container, right? But actually, it kind of defeats the purpose of Docker, which is to help developers isolate the different environments that the services are running. If you bundle all of them together, each of them will have their own dependencies, right? You can imagine your, um, if, if let's say you have microservices and uh, one, one of them requires this set of dependencies, one of them requires another set of dependencies, then you know, they're all bundled in a container, which means they share the same like so-called file system space. Then you're know, gonna run into the same problem, which is which we are trying to solve in the first place, which is uh the dependencies shouldn't clash with each other. Um, you should everything should be isolated, everything should be expected when you run it. it it's not like oh I update the dependency for this and then this thing breaks because it can't use the dependency for, for the for the second application. So that's why we need to isolate the different parts of our application. And a very common one would be, yeah, to just run a Node.js application with a backend, oh, sorry, with a database. So your database will be in one container, your uh, Node.js application will be on another container. Um, for this segment, you can try to follow along. We are running a bit out of time, but uh, you can try to follow along by doing git clone. So like, uh, like what Barab um, covered just now, uh, you're, you're cloning uh, this git repository, public git repository in your into your local machine. And that's how you can start working on it. So if you guys want to follow along, you can execute this command. Hopefully it works for you guys. And then what, okay, so what this application does uh, is it uses a Flask application, just like what we saw just now, but it also uses a second service. Uh, the second service is called Elasticsearch. So uh, basically you don't really need to know what it does, but uh, in short, it takes in a bunch of data and it gives you a proper way to query this data and search for things. And you will see that demonstrated uh, right now. Yeah, so um, again, this is your database, this is your Node.js, this is your Flask, this is your uh, Elasticsearch, right? Basically separate containers, you want to package them differently. Um, and the way to do this is through, uh, like, okay, you, you could say that, I have two containers I want to spin up. Why not? I just create a Docker file for each of them. And then Docker run the first one, Docker run the second one. It technically works. But uh, one thing about uh, what I mentioned earlier about Docker network is that uh, these two applications need to actually communicate with each other. And if they are uh, isolated in boxes, how are they going to know each other's existence? They only know each other's existence if they are shared in the same box. Right? So we want them to be different boxes but still get communicated with each other. That's why we need Docker network. Which okay, so just to show you what that Docker network is, it's so when you first install Docker, sorry, yeah, when you first install Docker, uh, it comes with three default networks. So one is bridge, one is post, and uh, this third one I'm actually not sure what it does. So the bridge one is the most important, which it bridges containers for you. Uh, the containers will use this uh, bridge default network to communicate with each other. Um, but um, if you want multi if you want multiple applications to communicate with, your, with each other while still being isolated from the rest, you kind of need its own bridge network. If you think about it, right? So you need to create a bridge just for your Elasticsearch and your Flask. This bridge should only connect these two. So how do you do that? You could Docker network. Uh, you, you could use Docker network, this command, to create your own network and then kind of link up the application. But it's a much easier way, obviously. And um, instead of having to create, uh, create like to Docker run twice, like two applications. So you Docker run twice and you create your own network and then you make sure they connect on the same network. Docker Compose basically does all that for you. So it's a tool that's separate from the core Docker engine. So you, when you do Docker run something, you're using the, the, the Docker engine that is bundled in there. Uh, Docker Compose is a tool that is built on top of this Docker engine. So uh, 
and it, it's useful because it helps you manage multi-container application uh, Docker uh, applications. You can also use it for single container applications. Like just now I mentioned about um, how when you update the code, it doesn't uh, update the image until you like until you rebuild it, right? So the Docker Compose can actually be used for a single container application to allow for this port reloading. When you save, it will just it will just work. You don't have to rebuild anything, you don't have to Docker run again. Uh it's it's quite necessary if you want to use Docker consistently. Okay, so what does this application actually do? Um, okay, so just now you saw that I had to like uh, docker run dash dash name dash p and then specify the port number, all this stuff, right? With Docker Compose, I'm in, I'm in this application. It's a different application called Food Trucks now. So Docker Compose, uh, this is literally all you need to do. You hit enter. Hopefully it works. Okay, okay. Uh, so Elasticsearch is doing its thing, it's initializing. And I've already put a Docker image beforehand. So obviously you can imagine that the Flux application and the Elasticsearch application uses different images. Um, I've put them beforehand, so that's why it will take much faster. Okay, it's already done. Uh, it will take much faster than if you run it yourself. If you run Docker Compose up right now yourself, fresh, I think it will take you like three minutes at least to download all the things and then start start running it. But once you download it once, it will stay forever on your local machine. So you'd have to download it again. Um, and I've exposed it on port 8080. So again, the same thing. Uh, it, the Docker container exposed port 5000 and I, I'm port forwarding from 8080 to 5000. So that's why I can just do uh, local host. See over here localhost 8080, and then it will show me this application. So this application is uh, pretty simple. It shows you a map of San Francisco, and uh, it shows you all the food places that you might want to eat at. So if you want like salad, it will, it will show you all these uh, dining locations, and it actually highlights it on the map, which is pretty cool. So that's what this application does. Uh, how does the search work? You might be wondering, how does, how come like when I type like burger, it will know what the burger places are. It's done by Elasticsearch. So this is, this is the usefulness of Elasticsearch in this application. And of course, the main UI is posted on using Flask. Yeah, so you, 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 can, you can try other, other stuff like taco. And then, um, you can see all these, uh, all these places that sell tacos apparently. Uh, Okay, so this is what this application does. And now you know that there's two parts to it, the Elasticsearch part and the Flask application part. How do you make this happen? How do you just, uh, okay, so I, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop these two containers. So you can see I'm stopping this first container and then wait a bit, it takes a while to stop. Yeah, and then you'll stop the Elasticsearch container. So now these two containers are stopped. You might be wondering, okay, how do I just do Docker Compose up and have all these running up and, and, and good to go? So uh, we look at the YAML file, Docker Compose YAML. Um, so this file is, uh, uh, so there's quite a lot to unpack here. It's a bit more complicated than your Docker file previously we covered. But let me just go through a few step by step. So, okay, Docker Compose YAML. You must name it exactly that um, for it to work. So there's three main sections and I've highlighted it in different colors. So the white color is the version, yellow color is the services portion, and then we have the volumes portion. So, okay, version, what does version do? We're using version three. Uh, and it, this doesn't mean it's, a, it's the third version of your Docker Compose file. It means we are using the version three syntax of Docker Compose. So if you can't just put like version like 4.6 or whatever. Like version 3 tells Docker Compose that you're using uh, the, the version 3 syntax, which is the most updated one uh, currently, I agree. Uh, so you usually either use version 3 or version 2. You are, you are unlikely to like deviate uh, from them. Um, services, this is the most important part actually, uh, highlighted in yellow. So you see we can, we have two services over here. Uh, we have the ES service, stands for Elasticsearch, 
and then we have the web service, which is the Flask app. So, okay, uh, let's go into uh, what the services actually do. So, okay, let's zoom in to the services, Elasticsearch and Web. Uh, and, okay, so we have a bunch of uh, directives to go through, right? Um, image is the compulsory uh, one. You, you, if you don't want to put image, you can have something called, it can be replaced with build. So image can be replaced with build. Um, I'll show you why, when to use which one later on. But for now, image, we are using image. And what image does is be self-explanatory. You either use an image that is found online, like that. Elasticsearch is using an image uh, without, uh, from, straight from Docker Hub, basically. You're not changing anything. And then web is using an image uh, by this guy. So I, this, this is also from Docker Hub. So um, the thing about this guy is he made this application. So he uploaded an image that is suited uh, specifically for, for this application. So you kind of, I guess you can see the local file and see what port he's exposing. Um, but for the Elasticsearch one, uh, it's just using a, a default Elasticsearch uh, image and you are giving the container a name. So this is actually optional. Uh, I think if you don't specify this, it would just use the name specified here. So it's a bit redundant, I think. Uh, environment is like your environment variables. So like, you know, in some of the web applications, you have a .env file um, to like store your, I don't know, your database host password, database username, like a bunch of, a bunch of stuff that, that, that is stored in the environment, right? Whether the debug should be true or false. Um, so this is basically the same. Um, there's no, there's no, like, like for each type of service, right? You can have different environment variables, again, as you can imagine. Like discovery.type equals single node is for Elasticsearch. You can't really put it, if you put it for web, it doesn't really make sense. Um, yeah. And then for ports, right? This is where uh, you can specify where to access this port, um, where to access this service that you're running. So your Elasticsearch service is exposed on the port uh, 9200. Um, I think to answer your question just now about uh, how how do you know it's nine two zero zero? I think you need to go into Docker Hub and actually see uh, like what port they are exposing in the Docker container, which supposedly is nine two zero zero. And then volumes. Uh, volumes is something that I I, I talked a bit about earlier. But uh, basically, if you want your state, so remember that Docker containers are stateless. If you want your state to actually persist, right, you actually need to add volumes. So volumes, when you start the application, uh, when you start the container, it, the volume will still contain the, the data that you uh, had before. So, I mean, think about a database. Uh, when you run an application, you add some uh, entries into your database, you stop your container, you run your container again, your entry will still be there uh, because there is no volume, volumes. And this, this ES uh, data one, right, is actually defined, it's actually defined uh, over here. Like, in the volume section. That's why we can use it. The, that's where it came from, uh, comes from. Um, and this Elasticsearch slash data thing, I think it's just where Elasticsearch normally stores its data. So it's it's something specified by Elasticsearch, like by default. Um, okay, so the web portion, you have the command. And uh, this command, it, it can remind you a bit of the CMD directive in Dockerfile, right? Like, if you guys remember in Dockerfile, we have this command, CMD. It's basically the same thing, actually. But uh, it's a, it, it, if, you, if, you, if you type out the command directive here, it will actually overwrite whatever you have in your Dockerfile. So uh, if it's the same thing, then you can just use the same thing. But uh, if, if it's not, then it's good to specify the command there. And for clarity also for someone to just see your Docker Compose and know what's going on. Uh, the ports, again, where uh, this port will fall to this port. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I changed it here locally, but I haven't changed it in the slides. It should be 8080, which is why uh, when I went to localhost 8080, I can access the application. Uh, makes sense, right? Because I'm accessing this and it will forward to port 5000, which is in the Docker container. 
uh, volumes. This part over here is basically saying, uh, see Flask app, right? Where, where do we get Flask app from? It's actually this, this folder over here. You see this Flask app folder? Uh, we are saying, uh, this is called bind mount, B-I-N-D mount in Docker. Uh, also a bit, okay, basically what it does is it's, a, it's kind of like a volume. That's why we specify it under the volume section. It's kind of like a volume, but it's basically binding uh, your current uh, application directory with the, the, with the directory that you want to store your code, that you want to like bind to in the Docker part of the, in, in the Docker part of the file system. So, so, so basically establishing a link between your code base over here and your code base over here. Like this is the bind mount. Um, so, uh, uh, Okay, and then the last part I haven't covered is depends on, depends on over here, tells Docker Compose, when you Docker Compose up, uh, what you should do, which service you should start first. Like, because some services depend on others, right? So like in, in the code base, in the code base for food trucks, we can actually see that, we can actually see here that, Yeah, so it, it creates a new Elasticsearch instance and then the host name is Elasticsearch, yes. So uh, the, the Flask application actually needs to refer to yes in order to work. So that's why we say it depends on the ES service. So we want to start the ES service first before we start this uh, Flask application service. That's, that's what depends on is for. Um, Okay, so uh, th this one, this part, the, the docker stop, docker remove part, isn't actually that important. It's just trying to say that if you have uh, containers already running on the ports, like let's say port 5000, as we did earlier, then you should stop it before you can docker compose up. If you docker compose up uh, containers that are using the same port as 5000, then uh, you actually throw an error and say your, your port is already, your port is already being used. So if you get your policy already being used, yeah, just check whether your, your current applications has been stopped or not. Um, so Docker Compose app basically is one of the most important commands in Docker Compose. Uh, you, you guys might see variations of Docker Compose, like Docker uh, dash compose. And uh, you, you, you probably will see that quite a lot on the internet, but actually they are different because uh, that is the old version of um, the CLI and Docker Compose is a new version, but it actually, I think that's the same thing like most of the time. Yeah, yeah. And then if you see this command called Docker Compose run, you might confuse it with like Docker run, like Docker run, you, if in Docker run, you, spin up a container, then Docker Compose run should do the same thing, right? Spin up multiple containers. But uh, it's actually used slightly differently. It's actually used to execute one-off commands. Like uh, if I want to access, access uh, if I want to add one entry into my database, I would just Docker Compose run and then... Um, Okay, I'll just do Docker Compose run and then add that one entry and then it will ex exit from the service. So it's it's not the same as uh, starting a container. Okay, so uh, what I mentioned earlier about the network, right? Uh, so so remember I said, okay, one reason we need to use Docker Compose is because we don't want to spin up two applications uh, separately and then have to spin up a Docker network uh, separately, all, manu all done manually, right? And I told you that Docker Compose actually does that for you. It spins up the containers for you. It spins up the network for you. And it puts the containers on the correct network. So Docker Compose does all that for you. And this, I'm just trying to illustrate here that uh, that is indeed what it does. So when we Docker a network, and then we list out all the networks now, right? You can see that previously we had three default networks. Remember, uh, we had the bridge network, and then we had, we had these two, these two at the bottom. And then now there's this food truck default network. So this is a network that's basically spun up by uh, Docker Compose. And 
we didn't even need to like do much about this. It, it just brings it up itself. And then if you inspect this network, uh, let's look at network inspect food trucks default. Okay, it will it will it will show you a bunch of stuff, and then you can see. Oh, currently it's not being run. So, okay, I need Docker Compose up again so to get the containers running. And then, yeah, so now you can see our containers are there. It basically, this, this inspect command tells us what containers are running on this network. And uh, food trucks, where one is running, yes, it's running. Same for two services. So they're all on the same network. And that's why when we do this, Elasticsearch post equals yes, it knows what yes is. Yes, it's defined in the Docker network as this being this other service. Uh, if it's not on the same network, then if you do ES, it will not find a host name called ES. And then it will say, like, I can't connect to the Elasticsearch server because it doesn't exist. But in this case, it works because uh, ES is on the same network as your Flask server. Okay, let's skip past this because we are actually already running over time. Um, yeah, okay, so this, this is also what I was talking about. When you Docker run, and then you can specify your service name. So like, if you want to add something to the database, uh, and the service is called DB, you can just Docker compose run DB, and then, uh, and then when you, uh, okay, wait, that actually that won't work, uh, because it's, you're using bash. So, um, okay, let, let's say your service name is the Flask app, uh, or web. And then you will, you will, after you do this, you will go into the interactive shell of your Flask app, and then you can start executing stuff there. Okay, so uh, what, what I was trying to say about uh, the port reloading, right, is that actually, if you realize, with what we have here, Currently, if you add a new route like I did over here, like this uh, hello world route, right? It actually, uh, okay, let, let's say I delete this. Okay, before we delete it, let's go, in, go into here, that uh, slash hello to check whether the route exists. It exists because it, you know, it returns us hello world. So great, okay, this route exists. Uh, what if we wanna delete this route? Then we comment this out, we save. Right, I just saved. And then we come here, we, we reload. It still exists. So, uh, yeah. So, so basically, after you change your code, uh, it's not persisted through the container. Um, and the way you solve it is to basically make two changes. Uh, one is, okay, so in the Docker Compose file, okay, so, uh, first of all, right, the image, right, you have to replace with build. And this was what I was talking about. Um, build means you build the Docker image again every single time, at this location, uh, every single time uh, they run Docker Compose up. So uh, in, in this case, we do a dot because uh, the Docker Compose file is here and our Docker file is right here. It's right beside it. So you can just dot this current directory, basically. So this is where uh, we are telling it what the current directory is. And then we also have to add something called environment. So we had environment for the uh, Elasticsearch. Now we need, an environment, we need an environment variable for the Flask app. So uh, debug equals to true. And then if you save this and you restart your container, Just give you a second. And then Docker Compose up again. Um, so right now we don't have the uh, slash hello route. So what you would expect from going to slash hello is nothing. It, it should not return you anything, right? So let's try that out. Yeah, this page isn't working. It doesn't send you any data because the route doesn't exist. So now you uncomment this. And then you save again. 
Okay. So if hot reloading works, if I enter now, it should show hello world and does show hello world. So um, basically that's how you achieve hot reloading in using Docker Compose. Uh, but I have to say that uh, this, this, this thing about adding like a environment debug equal true, uh, I mean, this build is pretty universal. Like uh, build basically says build, build, rebuild the Docker image every single time uh, at this location. But this environment variable, is, it works for Flask applications. So because we are working with a Flask application, uh, this is one workaround that people have found that uh, enables hot reloading. Uh, basically it tells you, okay, if the code changes, then uh, review your image and copy the code over into, copy the code over from the host back into the Docker. Um, but it doesn't work for uh, every, uh, every um, application you might be running. So you have to go online and search, okay, like, how do I achieve hot reloading for a Node.js application, for example. I think should it shouldn't be too different. Okay, now uh, we're finishing up. So uh, if you want to clean up all these things that you've started, um, okay, so you've seen me do quite a lot, which is just, which is literally just control C and then like you, it, will, it will stop by itself. But uh, after you do this, you can, Docker, uh, Docker contain, okay, Docker PS, and then none of it, none of it is running, right? But you dash A, you see this whole bunch of containers that I've just like created and deleted uh, through this entire workshop. So, okay, like these containers take up space, right? And you want to actually like clean off your machine after you've, you've done this workshop, after you've tried, um, after you've done testing out these containers. So um, you can just do Docker, systems prune and then this should delete all containers that are not currently being run so if i execute this all these containers should be gone but before i do that right um this this docker compose down command basically is the opposite of docker compose up the docker compose up you spin up all the containers spin up the network uh spin up the volumes docker compose down you basically stop all the containers you stop the network and i did command i did control C just now. This basically does what Control C does, which is to stop everything. Um, but you see the dash V flag. Right? This, this angle, uh, this square bracket is basically saying that it's optional. It's an optional flag. So if you dash V, it will actually also delete all your volumes. So Docker Compose down by itself doesn't delete your volume, but if you dash V, it will delete your volume. And you would want this when, let's say your database has a lot of entries that you were testing out that you were messing around with. Now your database has a huge bunch of like useless entries. You want to reset it, you do the compose down dash V. So all the data in the volumes will also be deleted. So this, this is really just a hard reset basically saying, uh, I don't want to delete everything. And then, okay, uh, now we can finally do Docker systems prune. Okay, yeah, so it actually warns me. So this will remove all stock containers, all networks, all the green images, blah, blah, blah. Just to clean up your, just to clean up your machine. Yeah, so you, you can see it's deleting a bunch of stuff. And then now if I do Docker, uh, just Docker PSA. Yeah, even with the dash A flag, we have nothing. Yeah, you're good to go. So, uh, but of course the images will still be there. Yeah, we still have all the images because uh, like images, you need to actually download them from the internet, right? So um, you can remove the images as well using the RMI command. Um, but usually people just remove the containers and the image remains because uh, you don't want to re-download an image every single time. Okay, we are almost done. Uh, so today we covered basic Docker terminology, basic Docker commands like Docker run, uh, Docker container, Docker build. And then um, we also created a uh, Docker files. And the purpose of Docker files is to create your Docker images, uh, is to help build your Docker image so that you can run them. And then Docker Compose finally to show you how you can manage multi container applications and also achieve things like port reloading in, in your disk environment workflow. Uh, and then, yeah, that's what's next. So, uh, NUS SDS will actually be hosting. Uh, a workshop this Saturday, right? Yeah. Saturday, then uh, 
10 to 12, we'll be hosting a workshop. So um, I think uh, we, we offer a Zoom option, but then uh, we recommend that you come to F16. Yeah, so... Uh, it's right next to LP27, right next to Kensington Gramati Station. So basically, we've, we've done all this work with Docker Compose, with Docker Files. Uh, it has to pay off somewhere, right? And that's where you just upload it onto, Docker, uh, onto Google Cloud Platform or AWS ECS, and it will just basically do most of it for you. I think you still need to configure uh, things here and there, because your development environment and your production environment is slightly different. That's kind of why we have the workshop as well. Exactly. You can't just upload it, but uh, you've done most of the hard work here. You've understood most of what Docker does, and you should be good to go to deploy it. Um, of course, there are other Docker tools, like we've learned about Docker Compose. That's one of the main ones, but there's also things like Docker Swarm, Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes is basically like a way to, let's say, let's say your Elastic Search container. Um, let's, say, let's, say, okay, let's say you deploy your application to the production, and you realize that one Elastic Search container isn't actually enough. You have a lot of users using your route. You need to spin up more instances of Elastic Container, uh, more Elastic, con elastic Search containers, basically. Uh, you just... So you need to deploy Kubernetes to do that job for you, to do that automatic scaling for you. So you will create, you can imagine like, you will create like a bunch of uh, containers just for Elasticsearch. And they are all on the same Docker network, as we mentioned. 